as you quite rightly said, there's, there's a lot of people out there, if you have noticed, that are very, very happy being unhappy. And if you take away their excuse for their unhappiness, they will fight you for it. They will hold on to that like a trophy. And they're on the journey. It's not right or wrong. You know, again, if it's you can't turn around and, and, uh, and try to invalidate or impose your model of the world onto somebody else. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Get Ready, and uh, very excited about this one. Uh, introducing to you a gentleman who I, I've spent a lot of time listening to <laughs> for the last month or two since I was first introduced to his work. And uh, so let me tell you a little bit about my guest. As an internationally renowned speaker, best-selling author, serial entrepreneur, and one of the most sought-after mentors on the planet, Peter Sage's unique and dynamic approach to self-mastery has led him to share stages with world-class leaders such as President Bill Clinton and Sir Richard Branson. Peter is an expert on human behavior and is widely regarded as a leading authority on effective personal transformation. He has dedicated over 30 years to his mission of raising global consciousness, uplifting thousands in the process with his trailblazing insights and transformative strategies. Welcome to Get Ready, Peter Sage. My goodness, what a welcome. Thank you, Brad. Much appreciated and really, really great to be here. Thank you. Well, thank you for being here. Uh, as I said, I have spent a lot of time recently listening to your wisdom and your insights. And it's it's interesting because uh, like a lot of folks on your on some of your webinars you'll say one of the worst things that can you can say as you're listening to a webinar is i already know that mm. and yet you know we we have a lot of very similar ideas and i say it in a different way when i'm listening it's like i already know that and this is so awesome so i'm hearing it in a different way and the myelin is just wrapping around <laughs> it's becoming yeah. even more firm so, and one of the things that uh, I was listening to you talk about recently uh, is a favorite subject of mine, and that's manifestation. Mm. And you have a lot of great insights about that. So uh, why don't you tell us a bit about your take on manifestation? Well, well, uh, for me, it's really down to understanding what manifestation or you know, what common vernacular calls the law of attraction, that kind of thing is. And for, for me, it's it's to be able to create or influence circumstances, events, or results in my life by using rules that govern the non-physical matter reality. You know, we're very familiar with rules that govern physical matter reality. We've mastered those. Yeah, through reverse engineering and observation, we can now tell you where the tide is going to be to the inch in the next 50 years on any given day. I mean, that's that's a testament to man's left brain dominance of cracking the code of how this materialistic Swiss watch of a universe operates mathematically. That's great. But if we were to use a movie analogy, which you know I like to use, if you are starring in the movie of your life, then when it comes to the material physical world, the only thing you can do is affect the scene of the movie you're currently in. You can make decisions, take actions, and directly impact what's going on in your current scene. And those decisions and consequences and, uh, and choices are, are going to lead to you know, different scenes downstream. But it's far better when you learn how to influence circumstances, events, or results in your life without having to grab hold of the current reality in the physical rule set. You can work with the non-physical rule set, which is just as tight and just as mathematical. Then you're no longer managing the current scene. You are starting to direct future scenes. And that is what I would call manifestation. Yeah, people talk about law of attraction. It's not really attraction. We use the word attraction because it gives us a, uh, a, a way of trying to understand how we bring things into the current scene. But what we're really doing is we're generating reality. You know, we are creating future scenes that once we get there, we feel we've attracted it. But we've actually created, we've generated that reality. But you know, it's a lot easier to think that we're attracting it like a magnet. But you know, the reality is we are influencing the probability of what's showing up in future scenes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean everything is already here as it is 
And it's, it's like with the reticular activating system, when we focus on something, suddenly we see it everywhere. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's creating that awareness, that ability to see it and make it, uh, make it real. And I, I just had to say for anyone who's, you know, some people who notice these sort of things, this was an interesting little manifestation thing. You can see that Peter and I both got the uh, memo about shirts. Here, <laughs> I was just telling Peter a moment ago, I have never thought about when I'm doing an interview, I wonder if I'll have a matching shirt with this person. And I put this shirt on and I just thought, maybe I should have another shirt in the office just in case. And so Peter shows up just before the thing and said, yeah, I just got here and I changed into this shirt right away. <laughs> Yeah, you know, we Matching think shirts, about things. I, it, it, it's a it's a beautiful example again. The universe working its magic in a way that yeah allows us to demonstrate what we're talking about. Yeah, <laughs> we beautifully set that up. Well, well done, us. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's the thing for for everyone else to look at. How do I then, you know, take take these ideas about what I'd like to have. And, and make them manifest, whether it's attracting or just noticing or, or shifting that, what, uh, what is the, what would you say is the, the first step in terms of creating that and bringing it into our, our standard reality? Probably things that your, your audience are already familiar with, but always good to be uh, um, yeah, a reminder. But I mean, the, the first thing is, is to have clarity around what it is that you actually want. And there is a distinction here that I'll share that may find useful because a lot of personal growth, including Think and Grow Rich and, and, and many other aspects of you know, the, the, the self-help industry, talk about the power of desire. Yeah. And you got to want it. But what they don't actually let you know is that desire is only useful up to a certain point, and then it's counterproductive. It's like anger. If anger can be very useful as an emotion for you to draw a line under your current victimhood. Yeah, if you can get absolutely angry at the fact you're still paying rent instead of owning your own home, you can get angry with the fact that you, know, you can't afford to eat off the left side of the menu instead of the right side of the menu. Right? That anger creates energy that you can then direct into a certain productive level of action. You know, or a decision. However, at that point, the anger has served its purpose. You don't want to carry that anger through further downstream into the actions around that decision. Now, it's, it's destructive, but it can be very constructive. That's why there's categories where people say, oh, all anger is bad. No, there isn't. You know, if it wasn't for anger, we wouldn't have had the civil rights movement. You know, if it wasn't for anger, you know, we'd still have apartheid. Right? So you know, anger has a, a way of being able to, in our own lives, be very constructive as a fuel if we use it in a limited and specified capacity. Now, back to what I said on desire, desire is almost similar. If you go to Dr. David Hawkins, the late great you know, author of Power Versus Force at Infinitum, and look at the map of consciousness, something I'm, uh, I'm a big student of. Desire calibrates at a very low power. It's a a temporary state of force rather than a permanent state of power. And the reason for that when it comes to manifesting is if you you need to know what you want. But if you then carry desire with you, the energy you're putting out is based on the presupposition that I don't have. And the universe doesn't listen to what you want. It doesn't care about what you want. It listens to who you are. And if you're vibrating as who you are from lack because you've set the game up that I won't be whole until I get fill in the blank, whatever I desire, then you're cutting off the power of the universe to bring it to you. And now you're left with just managing the scene you're in. Yeah, and you can hustle. Everybody can hustle and get a result, but it really doesn't break the mold. Most people backslide once they've stopped hustling. You know, they, they don't take a quantum leap into the next level. So the first step is obviously to desire, know what it is that you want, have a desire for something. But once you have desire, desire is only useful up until one point. And that is until you make a decision. Once you've decided, and, and think about it in an easy way. I desire that I need a, a bottle of milk yeah, for the fridge. Now, once you've made the decision to go get the milk from the supermarket, desire serves no useful purpose. 
You just put, you know, now you want the determination to act, to put one foot in front of the other and go to the supermarket. But if you walk into the supermarket, oh, I need the milk. I've got to have the milk. I must have the milk. That isn't serving any purpose. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, you're in that place of want. And if I'm still in this place of want, how, how can I have that? What you were saying earlier about anger, I, I never use the term negative emotions because they're all just part of the human experience. There's no good and bad. There's just some that are more comfortable than others. I'll say anger is, is like a smoke detector. It's the fire alarm. It goes off. We need to take that action. It's a great motivator for that. Once we have that plan of action, like you said, once, once you have that plan of action, you don't need the, this fire alarm to keep going off. I know the fire's there. I'm going to take care of that. And so I can see how that's the same with desire. It's like, great. Now I can put the plan into action and I don't need to stay in this place of, I have this want, I have this want, I have this want. Yeah. The desire is the email into your mailbox that says, hey, I need this. <laughs> right. Okay. There's something that I would like that I don't have. Great. Once that email has been read, right, just go joyously celebrate yeah, your journey towards yeah, being able to create that. There's a uh, an article and maybe maybe art, a number of articles about this where because in a lot of law of attraction training they'll say well you just have to feel you have it so rather than being in that feeling of want dealing in that be in that feeling of I have it and there are some people who have said well I have these studies that well if you do that then you're already satiated and you've now let go of it it's like no if you use that as to put in the plan of action and you move forward on the plan. So it's not a matter of going, okay, I have it now, and now I don't need to set that plan. It's all about how do I, how do I go about creating this life that I love? 100%. And I'll, I'll, I'll add a, a distinction to something that if you're familiar with the work, you, you'll obviously yeah, uh, relate to, but I'll, I'll share it for the, for the listeners as well. Uh, and that is the, the, the four levels of consciousness framework, which you know, I, I work with a lot. I was going to ask you to share this, so thank you. <laughs> that's okay. And because obviously on... For a lot of people, the word consciousness is nebulous. Mm. If you're a materialist, uh, left brain, Newtonian paradigm, you think consciousness is a byproduct of brain function, which obviously it isn't. Yeah, the brain doesn't produce consciousness any more than a television produces programs. Uh, so uh, if you're on the other side, which is you know, the far right brain, then it gets a little airy-fairy, a little bit too sort of you know, yeah, come by our, yeah, it doesn't pay the mortgage. So if Einstein said that you can't solve a problem at the same level of consciousness that created it, how do you actually navigate that by a level of understanding of what consciousness is? How do you create a framework? So the four levels is a very easy way for people to understand where, where they're at. And then I'll, I'll bring it back to what you just said about you know, the, the satiation, for example, because there are different modalities that operate at different levels of consciousness and that are relevant to those levels of consciousness. Just like if you're a, you know, 18 month old, diapers are useful, right? They're not useful when you're 25 years old, but they're required for a certain stage. So yeah, if you look at consciousness, the, the first level I call to me, which is victim. And we call it that because everybody there says, oh, I would have the life I want, but everything happens to me. It's the quintessential level of victimhood, the, uh, uh, the, the, the methodology, the, the unfolding process of victimhood is blame. Uh, that's, that's the mantra. Uh, and most people that stay there for any length of time, if they don't just get desensitized, so that's how life should be and, and live a sucky life, they realize that there's more to life and you know, life isn't going to bring you everything. It's time to make stuff happen. And that's when you move to the next level of consciousness called by me. And by me is the achiever mode, not the victim mode. Yeah, so achiever mode is like, I'm going to go grab hold of reality and force it to fit my pictures. I'm going to set goals, get motivated, yeah, and go out and start achieving stuff and, and take personal responsibility for what happens to me. And it's a great transition from to me to by me. It's just as a great transition going from diapers to a potty, right? But, you know, the, there's, the, there's, there's levels ahead, right? <laughs> and... Uh, the challenge with buy me is that you are disconnected from the ability of the universe to support you because you are now taking it on all on your own. You're out there hustling, working long hours, making stuff happen, trying to control things that ultimately you can't control, but you still try. That's where most stress comes from is people in buy me. 
trying to control stuff. Now, obviously, when you start getting to the level where we're teaching and talking about now, which obviously is an affinity with, with your audience, I call that through me. That's where life is flowing through you. You're in the flow state. That's where synchronicities happen. That's where things are more effortless. Doors open without you having to shoulder barge them in by me. Now, if you're talking to somebody who's in by me, and that's the life they live, and you say, well, just adopt the feeling of the wish fulfilled, to quote the great Neville Goddard. And they'll say, well, hang on. Yeah, but if I already have it, I won't feel motivated anymore. And guess what? In by me, that's correct. See, deadlines with for goals are very useful in by me because you need to be motivated. You're on your own. You've got to get in the river and swim upstream, and that takes energy. It takes effort. So you've got to be constantly on the grindstone. Now, when you finally outgrow that or out-evolve by me, you can't educate your way out of that. Yeah, you, you, yeah, you can't educate, yeah, you, you can't teach a, a three-year-old how to be a teenager, right? There's a level of evolution that is required. Uh, same with consciousness. So if you evolve past by me and you get into through me, deadlines are no longer relevant. Why? Because you are working on the universe's timetable. When you go to a restaurant, if you, there's nobody there and you say, oh, you've got to go in the kitchen and hustle and find ingredients and put them together and yeah, put it all, that's by me. I'm going to make my own soup. But in through me, you're sitting down, the maitre d' comes up uh, and you order the soup. You don't put a deadline on when the chef delivers it. You just have absolute certainty it's going to show up. And so it's different. And you don't, and the way that the chef goes to work for you is by adopting the feeling of the wish fulfilled. And that way, you're already happy en route. Yeah. Now, the distinction is you don't actually need the soup in order to feel good enough. And so when it shows up, you're just enjoying it anyway. And if I was to put a language pattern to this that people might be able to be, be, find useful, if you're operating in too many as a victim, you're constantly playing the game of feel great if, which is you know, if my ship comes in if yeah i get enough money if yeah i you know get lucky then i'll feel good I'll then happy, i'll man. be happy yeah, yeah. Uh, that's if in buy me you're playing a different game you're taking control buy me is feel great when i see yeah. buy me is when i get my goal when i get the million dollars when i get down to my ideal weight when i get this because i'm an achievement i'm going after it and I'm going after it because I want it in order to be happy or feel good enough or avoid the fear that of rejection or poverty or whatever it may be. So if I'm an achiever, I'm a buy me, I'm playing the game of feel great when, which means that I'm setting up the game so that once I get my goal, then I'll be happy or happier. And the challenge with that, as we've all experienced when we were in our buy me days, right? And for some of us may still be there. When we get the goal, we do feel like, uh, we feel great, but for how long? Usually it's a temporary feeling before that sense of emptiness comes back. And then we think, oh, well, like, I mean, I, I'll be happy when I make my first million. Well, I can tell you, if you're in by me, you won't be happy when you make your first million. You'll be happy temporarily, and then you'll actually be worried that there's an emptiness but because you realize that I actually need two million in case I lose the first, right? That game never stops. So if you are in through me, you're not playing feel great when you're playing feel great now and feel great now is the game that is in town when you play feel great now you're essentially saying this in fact let's let's look at it through the buy me lens because then it becomes obvious if you're in buy me playing feel great when when i get the million dollars when i get the house then i'll feel great now we've already established you won't actually feel great long term you'll feel great in the moment and the reason, by the way, is because you're no longer striving. Yeah, you can apply that to the, the whole principle of cigarettes. Smokers, for the most part, who say they enjoy smoking, which is less of them, but let's say you know, they, they want to enjoy smoking, they don't actually enjoy smoking. When you look at the psychological patterns that are running, what they actually enjoy is the, I'm no longer craving. 
But because that no longer craving is associated to having the cigarette and they like that feeling, they associate joy to the cigarette when it's not. You see, non-smokers, we don't have that. We don't, we don't need cigarettes in order to feel that sense of relief because we're not craving at all. Now, apply that to goals. When you're in by me, you're essentially playing the game of this. Yeah, feel great when, which is when I get the goal that I've set that I'm striving for, I will give myself permission to feel feelings that I could actually feel now, but I'm not letting myself do it. Yeah. And when you hear it through that lens, you kind of scratch your head and think, why would I do that? <laughs> See, and through me, you play feel great now. Right? It's like that way I can enjoy the journey en route to the goal. The goal is almost a, a byproduct of consequence. It's, it's, a, it's a calling for my desire. I'm going to go get something that I know that I would like, I want, but I'm not waiting until I get it in order to feel great. That's a different life. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, use the expression being motivated by misery. If I don't have misery to motivate me, then I won't do anything. If I feel good now, then I won't. It's like, it's just, that's just not true. As human beings, we're always having uh, some desire. It's like, well, I, I get up in the morning. It's like, oh, I want to have breakfast. I'm, I'm feeling great. I don't have to sit there and wait until uh, I'm uh, really starving. And go, oh, now I feel the pain. Now I'll get up and uh, go to the kitchen and make something. The, this idea of we look at some of the greatest achievements in history. It's like, you know, the Wright brothers didn't create the airplane because they were just so upset about being on the ground. Oh, this is so miserable. I need to uh, relieve that. It's like, we can be feeling good. And, oh, here's something that's exciting. I don't have to experience this, this misery in order to motivate me. We're, you know, yeah. this, this, this balance between motivation and resistance. When, when the motivation outweighs the resistance, we take action. It's like, oh, if I, don't, I don't have to be motivated. It's another, it. 100%, Brad. It's another by me concept. Yeah. Yeah. In, in through me, it's inspiration. Yeah, you're inspired to go do stuff. Why? Because we're here to explore, to, to live a, a, a life of openness to possibility, to have this effervescence, this feeling of, of, wow, I'm lucky enough to be born human in a time in history that my ancestors have dreamed about. I'm going to go play in this amusement park of life. And some of the rides are going to be scary. Yeah, that's part by design. Some, uh, some of the lessons I've got to learn, like don't go on the roller coaster after I've eaten lunch, yeah. right? <laughs> whatever, whatever it may be. But generally speaking, I have this, this you know, a sense of adventure, this unfolding joyous adventure around life. That's that's in through me now. And by me, you're still hustling and, and wrestling reality you know, to the ground to try to make it fit your pictures. And therefore, yeah, that you, you need motivating constantly. But in through me, it's in, you're inspired. That you don't need to to, to be motivated. Right. And as you quite rightly said, there's there's a lot of people out there, if you have noticed that are very, very happy being unhappy. And if you take away their excuse for their unhappiness, they will fight you for it. They will hold on to that like a trophy. And they're on their journey. It's not right or wrong. You know, again, if it's, you can't turn around and, and, uh, and try to invalidate or impose your model of the world onto somebody else. You know, if the four-year-old comes up to you and says, hey, dad, did you know that the moon's made of cheese? You don't say, oh, you stupid four-year-old. Let me go get you the geology reports from the Apollo mission that validates the yeah, meteorologist that uh, the moon is not made. You don't do that. And no they wouldn't believe you anyway. <laughs> yeah. And they wouldn't believe you anyway. Why? Because their best friend told them it was made of cheese. Right? And you ain't talking them out of it. So you know, where people are on their level of consciousness, because there's a big difference between physical maturity and emotional maturity, you know, they're, they're, they're not correlated. You know, there's a lot of adult teenagers you know walking around right uh but that's okay it may not be this lifetime and i'm pretty sure there were many lifetimes where i was an adult teenager mm, yeah, yeah, with, with, with all of my yeah, flaws and, and go through it. and i'm just grateful that i've had access to some mentors and some some insights that have helped me get over part of my ego growing up and hopefully yeah you know, part to come yeah likewise and and not just in other lifetimes there are still days or at least at least a few minutes where <laughs> I'm an adult teenager. Yeah. <laughs> falling back into that. 
and and yeah like you said look trying not to um to look at folks it's trying to live in the place of uh, through me without judging others and not shooting on others uh, because yeah. if at, at that moment that i'm shooting on someone else for living in by me i'm probably not living in through me as much as i think i am <laughs> Of course not. It's, it's, it's spiritual ego masquerading as some sort of self-grandiosity. Yeah. And if you want to fast track to a life that's sticky, struggle and effort, yeah, I'll give you a, a, a cast iron formula. Expect you from other people. Yep. Yep. Everybody else should think like I do and act like I do and speak like I do. And part of us does that because we, we know, obviously, we're the center of our own universe. But the mistake we make is that we think everybody else thinks that we are the center of our own universe. And of course, yeah, we're not. They are the center of their universe, and they don't give a crap about how you are appearing in yours. Right? You're a film extra in their movie just as they're a film extra in your movie. And when we realize that everybody's walking around in their own bubble of self-importance, quite often thinking, I wonder what everybody else is thinking of me and my bubble of self-importance not knowing that that's what everybody else is thinking as well, we can start to relax. We can start to appreciate that some people right now are in a drama. And it's not about what's going on now. They're in a drama. They solve drama at the dinner table. They'll find drama at the gas station. Yeah. Right? They solve it there because that's the genre of the movie they're in. Some people are in a comedy. Some people are in an action adventure. Some people are in a rom-com. Some people are in a horror show. Some people are in a soap opera. Now, you get to choose the genre based upon your level of consciousness based on your intention and how you want to show up. And the more you judge others from your level of moral superiority, the stickier your movie tends to get. I wonder how much of that is the, uh, you know, you often talk about the, um, the motivators and the, the certainty and the uncertainty is if everyone else was me, I'd get to have more certainty. And when they show up doing things that are not me, now it's uncertain. I, can, I can't predict what this person might do, and that, uh, and that pushes some fear buttons. Yeah. Uh, and if you want to have a, a way to hold certainty that will clarify whether it's empowering or disempowering, if you need certainty, and, and we all have some level of, of requirement for certainty. If I wasn't certain that this ceiling would stay up for the next 30 minutes, I wouldn't be sitting here, right? But I'm, I'm talking in general, most people really overdevelop the, the muscle of, I need certainty. I need to know how much money I'm going to make next month. I need to know you know uh, uh, if the, the world's not going to blow up. I need to know I'm going to be... A, yeah, there is no certainty at that level. So if you need certainty, you're pretty screwed. You're going to have a stressful, low quality of life. However, if you can generate certainty, you have a superpower. And the way you do that is by taking charge of your role as the star of your movie. Most people are walking around as unpaid extras in some big budget disaster film uh, that the media is trying to force down their throat. Uh, when you start to take charge of, well, I'm, I'm the star of my movie, not from an arrogant place. Yeah, I've, I've got friends that work with Keanu Reeves and, and they say he's one of the nicest guys in the world on set. He goes up, he takes time to, to speak and, and, and inspire the extras or you know, talk to the security team or you know, take them for, for dinner or what have you. Yeah, and it's, it's, there's no ego. Oh, I'm the star, like you know, in his early days, Val Kilmer and, and, and people like that that were you know, would look down and be this diva on set. But you know that when Keanu or Brad Pitt or somebody walks on set, when they are the A-list star of that movie, they're not looking for permission from the film extras. They're not looking for approval from the film extras. They don't suffer from the good opinion of other people as a, a, a way to validate themselves. They own themselves. You know, there's a lot of people in, on this planet that can sing and dance as well as Rihanna. But when Rihanna walks into a room, she doesn't own the room. She owns the building. That's the energy, the attitude, the certainty she generates, not the certainty she's looking for or needs. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's when you have, that, and you have that confidence that, you know, when you have the confidence, you're connected to source and it's not in the by me. I have to put all the effort and come into that through me. It's like, I know there's something that's got my back. I know that when I stand on that stage to sing and open my mouth, 
something's going to come through me and it's going to deliver something powerful. Yeah. And if you look at it, that's essentially most of the story of the parables in the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. We, 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 uh, that, that's another rabbit hole we could jump down. But that's, uh, <laughs> I, I, know, I know we're getting uh, tight on time. So I want to see what that's we can do to ask somebody. <laughs> That'll be a further uh, later episode. So, well, but you did say the four stages. So we've uh, moved from uh, to me to by me to through me. And then and then we get to essentially the, the highest level of consciousness where a lot of the spiritual masters you know, arrived out and taught from, which is ASME. And ASME is essentially non-duality. Non uh, the common vernacular, you call it oneness, for example. But it's where you transcend a, uh, a this and a that. There's no cause and effect. Right, uh, by me is cause and effect. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, to me, victim. Yeah, you are the yeah. You, know, you, you, you are the the after effect. Yeah, you're the victim on there. But uh, in by me, you try to yeah. Uh, yeah, it's all about cause and effect. In through me, you're causing an effect. All right, you you are generating that. Now in as me, there is no separation. Yeah, that you you see yourself. Uh, yeah, as part of everything, the, the, the universal whole. Now, I am in no way uh, promoting that I've been anywhere close to that. Yeah, you know, most people experience that temporarily in you know, uh, a small variety of ways, either in deep, intense levels of meditation or more often plant medicine. You know, they take a, a plant medicine journey or some sort of level of psychedelic yeah, whether that's you know psilocybin or dimethyltryptamine or whatever it may be, ayahuasca, for example, uh, and they have this sensation of oneness with the universe. They now see there is no separation. But then we drop back into third dimensional reality in a you know, limited level of consciousness, and it becomes a memory rather than a way of life. So yeah, uh, ASME is kind of the, the, the top stuff. It kind of shows us where we're going. Yeah, if we're in earth school right now, I'd say that would be kind of PhD, college level, whatever, but uh, not something that I'm aiming to, to, to reach anytime soon. I'm just happy to put one foot in front of the other and, uh, and see how the journey unfolds. And that's good for today. <laughs> if, I, if you never get passed through me, then uh, it's still a life very well lived. And, uh, and I appreciate how you show up in that way and and how you let the information come through i mean as i've spent a, a lot of time listening and i and i love the way that you translate these ideas and, and and put them out there um i love that you are a fan of analogies like i am and you know there's a very great history of teaching through parables <laughs> absolutely uh, and i appreciate you for that as well you know so you know, from from that perspective, Brad. I mean, I'm I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to share on your platform and, and support the great work that you're doing with your tribe. 